13, Acts chapter 20, verse 13. That's where we got to last week. <clears throat> Just recap a few things we did talk about last week. We started in chapter 20, uh, of course. We talked about how chapter 20 uh, could be titled a minister's farewell, and there's three different farewells in this chapter while Paul here is uh, uh, is at or when, when he makes his way uh, back to the Ephesian elders there as we'll get to a little bit later but let's look we looked at chapter again chapter 20 verse uh, number one and we talked about a farewell journey verses one through five verse one of course Paul says goodbye to the Ephesian uh, disciples there in Ephesus and in verses one and two and three, he uh, makes some uh, trips back to some of the churches he had established. He goes through the region of Macedonia. Remember we talked about that. That's the cities of Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. And then it says he went on to Greece, or Achaia. That's the region again. And that's uh, the cities of Corinth and the city of Athens. And he went back and he encourages again these churches there that he had once started. Well, verse number three, because the Jews had plotted uh, to kill him apparently when he if he was going to attempt to sail uh, they were going to kill him so he decided to go over land back through these same regions Greece and Macedonia and visit some of these churches once again and on his way back that time he picked up seven traveling companions verse number four and we mentioned their names a little bit talked just briefly about some of those men that he picked up there and then verse number five he went ahead and sends them on ahead to Troas and that's about 120 miles from from Philippi and then when he got the uh, uh, Troas verse number six um, Luke uh, rejoins Paul at this particular time actually he picked up Paul while he was at Philippi I remember uh, I mean Paul picked up Luke while he was at Philippi Luke had probably stayed back and ministered there from uh, chapter number 16 so Luke rejoins the group and then we see a farewell service in the next few verses verse 6 through 12 when he got to Troas and we talked a little bit about that service how it went of course it was on the Lord's day first day of the week verse number 7 it was also with the Lord's people verse number 7 verse number 8 says the disciples were gathered uh, together in the upper room and it was also uh, they partake of the Lord's Supper verse number 7 it says they met one thing they did when they met was to break bread anytime we see in the a lot of times we see that term in the New Testament it's talking about the Lord's Supper. And also we see that the Lord's message was preached. Verse number 7, we know Paul preached the long sermon we talked about. Then verse 9 and 10, we see the Lord's power in this service. Remember this young man, Eutychus, he, he fell asleep and uh, fell out of the window and he died. And Paul revived him or brought him back to life. Verse number seven, they went back uh, to the upper room, continued their service, and this is probably where they actually partook of the Lord's Supper after Paul's sermon, and they also probably had a regular meal, and they fellowshiped all night. We know that's true, the fellowship part. They did fellowship all night, and we talked about having, how having food, fun, and fellowship after church service is a good thing. Nothing wrong with that. We see Paul and his company did it here. Verse number 12, the Bible says the church was very comforted to see Eutychus alive, and a whale, after, a whale after what had happened to him. So that got us to, uh, again, verse number 13 here in Acts chapter number 20. And in the next few verses, verses 13 through 17, we're going to see where Paul visits some more of these cities uh, in different places that he may or may not have been in the past. So let's look at these verses again. Acts chapter 20. I'll read verses 13 through 17. Make a few comments about some of these other cities here that he went to before we get to the main part of our lesson today, which is Paul uh, talking to the Ephesian elders or the Ephesian uh, disciples. In verse number 13 says, and, and, and we went before to ship and sailed into Asos, there intending to take in Paul, for so he had appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Asos, we took him in and came in to Mytilene. And we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios, and the next day we arrived at Samos and traveled to Trogelium, and the next day we came to Miletus, for Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus. Because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible, 
for him to be at Jerusalem the day of the Pentecost. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders uh, of the church. So again, we see here in verse number 13, uh, Luke rejoins them because he says, when we uh, went before the ship and sailed uh, to Asos. So uh, Luke was with them here at this particular time. And him and, and the, the rest of the party, uh, they went by boats as they sailed on to Ephesus. And I mean, to Asos. If you've got your map, not far from Troas. Again, top top left corner, we see some of these cities. you got Troas. Then you got Asos. It's only about 20 miles. It wasn't wasn't a long distance there between these two cities. But but Luke and the rest of the company they they sailed from uh, 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 Troas over to Asos. But Paul here, for some reason or another, says he elected uh, to go afoot. Uh, and the last part of verse number 13 says, minding himself uh, to go afoot. So we don't really know why he chose just to, to go by himself over land. A couple reasons prob probably he knew it would uh, more than likely be the last time he would see some of these, uh, some of these disciples there that he had made in, in Asos and Troas in this area. So he might have, might have, may have wanted to spend a little more time with some of them possibly. Secondly, uh, he may have had some alone time during this this walk and he could spend a little more time uh, with God knowing the things that were uh, about to take place in his life so that may have been the reason that Paul wanted to just walk instead of sail with the other with the other company well, we see no, verse number 14 they met back up and when he met with us at Asos we took him in and came uh, to Mytilene so they met up again here at Asos, and then they went on to the next city. The next city uh, was Mytilene. If you see your map, you'll see there it's only about 40 miles from Asos. So they uh, got together, started sailing around some of these little uh, places, some of these little islands here. And the next place they made them find, found themselves was at Mytilene. And in verse number 15, we see several other cities here that they 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 travel by or stop in. It says, and we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios. The next day we arrived at Samos and traveled to Trogelium. And the next day we came uh, to Miletus. So if you see your map there. Again, they were uh, at Mytilene, and then it says they sailed on uh, to Chios. Now, your map, uh, it starts with a K, and, my, and, and some of your Bibles, it may be spelled with a K. Mine's spelled with a C-H in my Bible, but in the map here, it's spelled with a K. So they went to Chios. That's about 50 miles from Mytilene, so again, it wasn't that far. Then it says they went on to Samos, and, and Samos was about 50 miles from Chios. If you look at your map there, you can see. So these, these cities weren't that far apart from each other, especially if they were traveling by boat, and that's how they were traveling at this particular time. But then it says they went to Trogelium. Now, Trogelium is not on this particular map that I, that I used, that I printed out. So it's not, not on here, but it's somewhere between Samos and uh, Miletus because that's their next stop. And Miletus here, uh, it is on your map. If you see Samos and then on to uh, Miletus, and that was about 60 miles from Samos. So these are just some of the other cities uh, and that they traveled by, stopped in, probably ministered a little while as they were on their way uh, to Miletus. But notice we get to verse number 16. It says, For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia for he hasted if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So if you notice on your map, uh, if Ephesus, Ephesus is right there in, about halfway in between the city Samos and Miletus. So he didn't actually go to the city of Ephesus. They sailed by because he knew probably if he took time to go actually to the city of Ephesus he knew he would probably want to stay there a while and, and talk to the fellowship with the, the disciples and the brethren there but he wanted to make it uh, to Jerusalem uh, for uh, Pentecost it says here uh, in these particular verses so that's probably why they just sailed by and didn't actually stop at Ephesus uh, at this particular time so he goes on, verse number 17, and, and from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders uh, of the church. So to save a little time again, because he wanted to be at Jerusalem for Pentecost, once he got to Miletus, he called for the elders uh, or the leaders of the church at Ephesus to come there to this particular city and meet him there so he could actually talk with them 
there and then he would give his farewell message and that's the last farewell that we're going to talk about here in chapter number 20 we've talked about remember a farewell journey where he visited a lot of these cities he had already been to we talked about the farewell church service he had there at Troas and then now we're going to see this farewell message to the Ephesians here to the Ephesian elders that he has while he's here at Miletus, and we'll see that beginning in verse number 18 through the rest uh, through the rest of the chapter, verse number 38. I'm not going to take time to read all that right now. We'll just read a few verses uh, at a time. But before we get into this farewell message, uh, Luke, he, uh, he reports or he records eight different messages given by the Apostle Paul uh, to various people uh, here in the book of Acts. Uh, one was to a Jewish synagogue and congregation, Acts chapter number 13. We talked about that. And then uh, two different times, uh, he had a message to the Gentiles, Acts chapter 14 and Acts chapter number 17. We've already dealt with those as well. So that was a couple more messages. And then here in chapter number 20, we see he has a message for church leaders. And again, that's the Ephesian church leaders here. We'll see here in just a minute. And then later in chapter number 22, he has a message to a Jewish mob. And then, verse, and then in chapter 23, we see he has a message uh, for the Jewish count, council uh, that had gathered uh, together, you know, before, right before his, or, or during his trial, right before his trial. And then two different times he has messages for government officials, as we'll see later once we get there in Acts chapter 24, and also in Acts chapter number 26. So various messages that Luke records that Paul gave, but this one here uh, to the Ephesian elders here is a, it's a little bit different. Uh, because Paul, you know, Paul was a, he was a missionary, we know, he was an evangelist, but he also was a pastor, he had a pastor's heart. And this, this message reveals that pastor's heart that the Apostle Paul uh, had. We know an elder, bishop, we see that in the, in the Bible, we know that's typically referring uh, to a pastor. And a pastor, you know, was an overseer, and a, and a pastor uh, watched after their flock the best they could and tried to take care of them, again, the best they could. Hence, the farewell message here that we're going to see the Apostle Paul give to these Ephesian elders. And we'll break it down into three different parts, this message here. First, uh, he, he reviews the past in this farewell message here that he gives to the Ephesians. And then secondly, he talks about the present. He gives a testimony of the present, things that are currently happening. And then thirdly, he actually gives them a warning about the future and things that could possibly happen in the future. And that's, you know, that's a good out, outline for, for pastors today uh, to follow. Talk about the past, the present, and also a warning about the future and future events that, that may affect the church. So let's look at this, this farewell message here that the Apostle Paul gives to the Ephesian elders here while he is at his stop here at Miletus. So let's look at the first part of his message. And again, we're talking about the past, a review of the past. Let me read verses 18 through 21 and then say a few things about some of these verses here. Verse 18 here, Acts chapter 20. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and, and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. So we see here Paul... He reminds them a few things here about the past. And, and uh, he says here in verse number 18, he didn't just gradually uh, work his way into the ministry there. Notice he says, uh, from the first day uh, that I came uh, into Asia. So he immediately started preaching the gospel uh, once he got uh, into Asia, to Ephesus in this particular city. And he reminds them. How he did that. Also, uh, verse number 19, he let them know, he reminded them that his motive was to serve the Lord. He said he did it. He said he served the Lord here in all humility of mind. He was not, Paul was not interested in, in making a name for himself or, or in making a, a lot of money or, or even enjoying a, an easy life, as we'll see later. In verses uh, 33, uh, 34, and, and 35, he talks about how he didn't covet any man's silver and how he worked with his own hands 
sins and, and how he, he did what Jesus said. And he, he said it's more blessed to give uh, than to receive. So we know Paul was, he was a bond servant, right? Or he was a servant of the Lord. He of, often opened uh, his epistles with that, talking about he was a servant of Christ. He was a bond servant of Christ. He would start a lot of his epistles with that. So he let them know he was serving the Lord, uh, you know, with, with all humility of mind here, it says. And he wasn't in, interested in making a name uh, for himself. And he also, uh, you know, by doing that, you know, he didn't, he didn't want to be one of these religious celebrities. And, you know, we see, these, we see them all around today. You know, that all the big names that you see on TV and here on the radio and stuff. And, and I'm sure some of, them are, some of them are doing good. You know, some of them are getting the gospel out of that. But some of them, you know, they just, they just, they're just seeing it for the money, the recognition. Well, Apostle Paul here, he says, I'm not that way. He says, that's not why, why uh, I got into this business. That's, not why, I, that's not, not why I became a missionary. It's not why I became a preacher, an evangelist, and a pastor. But I'll just notice the last part of verse number 19 here as well. He says, he says, um, he says, and with many tears uh, and temptations which befell me by the lying and wait of the Jews, and he wasn't ashamed to let them know that, that he had he had he had shed a lot of tears during his ministry, and he had he'd had a lot of trials, he'd had a lot of temptations during his ministry. Uh, again, most of most of these temptations and trials was because he says of these unbelieving Jews, because they was constantly trying to trick him, get him, even trying to kill him. We just talked about that a few verses ago. He had to go a different direction because. Because the Jews were lying in wait uh, to kill him, and so and he he mentions that here later in his sermon sermon down in verse number thirty one uh, he says neither watch and re therefore watch and remember by the space of three years I cease not to warn er warn every one of you night and day how with tears so he had these tears and he, he told the Ephesians the church the church elders here of that but also uh, he told he told the Corinthians. Uh, basically the same thing. Second Corinthians chapter two, verse number four. He says, "For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, uh, he says, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you should know the love which I have more abundantly towards you." So not only to the Ephesians, but to the Corinthians, everybody he visited, also to uh, to the Philippians. Philippians chapter number three. Verse number 18 says, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. So the church at Philippi, he, he had many tears for them. And Paul, he, and so he wasn't ashamed to let them know here that he had these tears, also these trials and these temptations. And again, remember, he's, he's reviewing the past, some of the things that has happened in the past. And then verse number 20, he says, And now I have kept back nothing that is profitable. Uh, for you. So he reminded them also, he says, I, I haven't kept a single thing back that might help you to become uh, a better Christian. He says, I've declared all uh, the counsel of God. He, he, reminds, he says, he repeats that again over in verse number 27, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all uh, the counsel of of God, and we also see here in verse number twenty, his message was the same. No matter, he reminded them that no matter where he went, he says, "If it, if he said, if I've taught you publicly, but he says I've also taught you privately, house to house." And his message was the same, no different. Whether whether he taught in public to everybody, or whether he just went maybe to to different houses and taught just single families, maybe. Uh, privately, his message uh, was the same. Verse number 21, this was his message. Testifying, he says, both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord, <coughs> excuse me, Jesus Christ. So, it, again, his message was the same publicly or privately, but his message was also the same whether he was preaching to the Jews or whether he was preaching to the Gentiles or the Greeks. Here's he says in verse number 21. And what was that message? That message was repent of your sins and believe in Jesus Christ. That was uh, his message. Verse number 24, the last part of it. He says uh, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So that was his message to anybody was the gospel of Christ. And he, he reminds the Corinthians of that when he writes to them. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory that which I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, 
how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That was Paul's message. Everywhere he went, to whoever he preached to, was repentance. He preached the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, first part of his sermon here, his farewell sermon, was a review of the past. He talked about some things that he had done in the past. Now, beginning here in verse 22 through verse number 27, he changes a little bit, and he's going to start talking about the present. And he talks about a testimony here of the present. So let's look here and read verse, starting verse number 22. It says, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth, in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I life, my, life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take to you record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. So, verse again, he, he's changing here a little bit from the past to the present. And the first few verse, first few words of twenty two tells us that he says, "And now, uh, behold." So uh, he's shifting again the emphasis from the past now uh, to uh, the present. He says, "And now, behold, I go bound in the spirit." Under Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall uh, befall me there. So he led his friends here. He led his, his disciples here uh, of the Ephesian church. He let them know, you know, how he felt, and he he told them that he was he was being led by the Holy Spirit to do these things and to go to these places. It says he was bound in the Spirit. That just means he was being led by the Holy Spirit. And he says, I know, he says, I know the Holy Spirit wants me to go back to Jerusalem. He says, but I don't know what's going to happen to me there. I'm sure there's probably going to be danger, he says, dangers uh, that's, that's going to happen to me. But he says, because the Holy Spirit is, is impressing me to go there, he says, I've got to go. So he let, his, he, let, he let his friends know that that's what he was going to do. But verse number 23, he says, save the Holy Ghost, witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions uh, abide me. So at some point in time, the Holy Spirit had let him know that, that yeah, there's going to be there's going to be trials. There's going to be things that happen to you once you get there. Uh, but I want you to go anyway. I want you to testify of the gospel for of, of Jesus Christ anyway. So the Holy Spirit had told him that things were going to happen. Uh, but he says I'm, I need to go anyway. The first part of verse number four, he says again. He said the Holy Spirit's already told him that things are going to happen to him. But he says, but none of these things. Move me now. A lesser man here uh, would have probably found uh, a way to escape, or probably found a way to get out of having to go uh, to, to Jerusalem, knowing that things were going to happen to him there. But not Paul. He says, "I let none of these things move." We know he was ready. He was ready to die for the Lord Jesus Christ if necessary. We know ultimately. We know that that he did. Uh, he was a martyr uh, for the Lord. So he says, none of these things move me. I'm going to go. I'm going to do it anyway. And so in the next few verses here, the, the last uh, part of or the, the rest of verse 24 and then two or three verses um, coming up, we see we see six pictures of his ministry here that he talks about. And and he explains why he's not going to quit and why he's going to continue to go. Uh, and he, he sees himself as uh, some different different types of, of people. And the first one here, he sees himself, uh, we'll call it as an accountant. Notice next what it says in verse number 24. He says, but none of these things in the movie, he says, neither count I my life dear unto myself. So he had examined uh, everything that, that he had, all his, his, his assets and liabilities, if you want to call it that, and he decided, he says, I'm going to put Jesus Christ ahead of all these things. These things aren't important, he says. He says, so I'm going to put all these things. He's, remember, he's, he's, he's talking, he's referring to himself as an accountant, so he's accounting all these things. But he says, those things aren't important. What's important is getting the gospel of Jesus Christ out. I'm going to turn over you, you, you don't have to if you don't want to. But in Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter number 3, I'm going to read several verses here again. 
He says, he said, I don't, I don't count any of, any of these things important uh, to, to me. He says, I don't even count my life dear unto myself. Let's see what he says in Philippians chapter number 3. Again, writing here. Of course, here he's writing to the church at Philippi. He says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write, to write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but unto you it is safe. <coughs> Excuse me. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus, have no confidence in the flesh. He says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath off where he might trust in the flesh, I'm more. And notice he goes on to tell, tell us why. He says, Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he says, he says, you know, he says, I, I've done all these things. He says, you know, I, I've, I've kept the law. You know, I'm the Pharisee of the Pharisees. I'm the best. He says, I would, I would have been the best they could be. He says, yea. He says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus by the Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, be made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So, you know, Paul here says, he says, all these things that, that, I, that, that I've done, that I've accomplished or whatever, uh, and things maybe that I could do, he says, he says, they're rubbish. You know, he says, I count them but dunks. So they're just rubbish. He says, the most important thing, he says, is I, is I get the gospel out, that I serve uh, the Lord. And that's what he's saying here back over in our lesson here in, in verse number 24. He says, neither count I my life dear, his life, his assets, anything he, say, he had. He says, it wasn't worth anything. Getting the gospel out was the most important thing. So, so he sees himself first here as an accountant. The next, he sees himself uh, as a runner. He goes on to say, he says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. He says, So that I might finish my course with joy. He says, So I might finish my course with joy. He knew that God had a special plan for his life, and he wanted to finish that plan. He wanted to accomplish that plan. He wanted to, to finish that race. And, and other times, you know, Paul referred to uh, being a Christian as, as running a race and being in a race. Philippians 3, verses uh, 12 through 14. Just a few more verses here later from what I just read. It says, Not as though I had already attained, neither were already perfect. For I follow after that I may apprehend, which also I am apprehended of Christ. Brethren, I count, my, not, count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth, he says, to the things which are before. He says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So it's like a runner, right? He's pressing forward he's going forward also first corinthians chapter 9 verses 24 through 27 when he's writing to the corinthian church he says know ye not that they which run in a race run all but one receiveth the prize so run that ye may obtain and everyone that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown but we an incorruptible i therefore so run not un not as uncertainty so fight i not as one that beateth the air but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I preach unto others, I myself should be a castaway. So he, he's a runner here. He wants to finish that race. And we know, of course, we know Paul ultimately finishes that race, does he not? When he writes his uh, last epistle second, to Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. We all know these probably by heart. He says, for, for I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departure. Is a hand. He says, I have fought a good fight. He says, I have finished my course, and I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, not to me only, but unto all them also which love his appearing. So he's talking about being a runner here uh, in verse number 24. So he sees himself as an accountant, as a runner. But next he, we, he sees himself as 
as a steward. And we know what a steward is just somebody that manages either somebody else's possessions and or maybe their own. That's what we know what that a steward is. It's just somebody that manages something. Notice he says here, verse number 24. Again, but he says, but I count, but he says, but neither, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. So again, he, he, this ministry, he says, which he's received of the Lord Jesus, he's got to be a good steward of it. And a steward also, typically, uh, they, they own little, uh, but they possess uh, everything. So he says, this ministry was given to me. And so I'm, I'm supposed to be a steward of this ministry. 1 Corinthians 4, verse number 2, he reminds them there at the Church of Corinth. He says, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found Faithful. So think about it. If you, you know, if, if you owned a, a lot of stuff, a lot of property, a lot of possessions, whatever it may be, and you wanted somebody uh, to manage that, you wanted somebody to be a steward of that, you would want them to be faithful, right? Just like he says here. He says it's required in stewards or, or being a manager that they be found faithful. I mean, I wouldn't want somebody running, running things I had trying to manage my things if they weren't going to be faithful in doing it. So that's what uh, the Apostle Paul here, he reminds the church there. So we, uh, we are to manage today what God has given us uh, to the best of our ability. We are to manage it faithfully as well. Whatever God's given us to do, you, me, whoever it may be, whatever he's given us to do, we need to be good stewards of that and manage that. So he sees himself here as a steward, an accountant, a runner, a steward. But also in the last part of verse number 24, he sees himself as a witness. He's the last part of verse 24. It says, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Well, I talked about that a little bit earlier. He says, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. To testify means to solemnly uh, give witness to. That's what to testify means. And, and, and that's, a serious, that's a serious business. And you know how it works uh, in a court of law. If they, get, if they get a witness to come by and testify, that witness is saying, okay, this is what I know. This is what I've seen, whatever the case may be. So that's very serious because that, that could mean life or death to whomever it may be that's on trial, right? We, we know how that works in our court system today. So it's very serious uh, to be a, a good witness. And that's what Paul, he considered himself to be a good witness. And talking about life or death, he reminds the Corinthians of that in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. It says, for, for we are unto God a sweet Savior of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one... We are the Savior of death unto death, and to the other, the Savior of life unto life. And who is sufficient for the things thereof? So, so he reminds them that being, this, being a witness here, it's a very serious uh, thing. So that, that's a few things here he sees himself as verse number 24. We've got a, we've got a couple more uh, in verse number, uh, starting in verse number 25. Uh, he sees himself as as a, as a herald, and we know a herald is that's an, an official messenger uh, that's bringing news. We know that's what a what a herald is. He says, "And now behold, I uh, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face uh, no more." So remember the witness tells what they know. They tell what has happened to them, what they have seen. But the herald tells what the king has told him uh, to declare. And that's what Paul's doing. He says, you know, he says, I've been sent to preach the kingdom of God, to preach the gospel. So that's what he was doing. Let me give you one more verse here. Second Corinthians 5, verse number 20 says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in God's stead, be you reconciled to God. So a herald and an ambassador, kind of the same thing. So he saw himself here as this herald. We'll stop here and look at the last thing he sees himself here as, beginning in verse number 26. And then we'll finish up with this farewell message here he has uh, to the Ephesian elders, Lord willing, next week. <laughs>